such a great turnout tonight as Archbishop Zinkula shares with us on the Eucharist as a sacrament of charity. You may recall that the bishops of the United States have initiated a time of Eucharistic revival, and so we're in the second year of all of that, and a lot of pastoral activity geared toward deepening our love and appreciation for our Lord's real presence in the Blessed Sacrament. We offer a special welcome to our visitors tonight, especially to our friends from Holy Spirit Parish. We try to work together here in downtown among various ways of faith formation and youth ministry and such. Special greetings to Father Gardner and Father Frieden and your former pastor, Archbishop. So glad to be together tonight. You know, the pictures of the bishops there are on the west wall of the cathedral center. And it used to be, I think, that up at Balltown at uh, Bright Box Restaurant, that they would have a picture of the local priest and the bishop. And the local priest, I think, was always pictured just a little bit higher than the rest of them. And so Archbishop used to serve up there. So I, you notice over there, his picture's a little higher than the rest of them. So, so we certainly esteem him well and are, are glad for your presence among us. He, he didn't designate the height of the nail hole. We did that. <laughs> Archbishop, we're glad you're here. Thank you. You're welcome. There probably was already a nail in the, in the wall. They didn't want to put another one in there. So I'm going to talk about the Eucharist. Um, we are in the midst of a Eucharistic revival here in the United States, but also there's this synod that's been going on for a number of years, like, what, I don't know, three years or whatever. So I'm going to kind of, and they go together really um, pretty well. The um, Apostolic Nuncio for the United States at our bishops' conference meetings, he always gives a talk. You know, and, and the last two or three, he's kind of talked about how they fit together. And so I, I, I agree totally with him. So I'm going to kind of just start out with the, um, the synod and, um, and kind of the context of all of this, though, is love, right? Um, the, um, the, the apostolic exhortation I'm going to uh, focus on after this initial little prelude thing from Pope Benedict is... Sacramentum Caritatis, the Sacrament of Charity. Well, I'd just like to start. <clears throat> As we all know, in John, he tells us he is right? you know, um, all powerful, all, all, all omnipresent, um, you know, all, all knowing, all everything. Gosh, you know. There's so much you can say about, about God. So people sometimes say it's easier to kind of talk about what God is not, right? But um, we can kind of sum it all up, you know, just one word. God is love. Not just that God is loving, he is, but God is love itself. The essence of God is love. So whenever there's true, authentic, genuine, sincere love, God's there in the, midst, in the middle of all that. So I kind of like, you know, so um, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is a community of love. I like to, you know, how, what can you say about the Trinity? It's such a, you know, it's kind of abstract, and how do you break that open? The, the analogy I, I like the best is, um, to, so Father, the, God the Father is lover, God the Son, this comes from the fathers of the church, one of them, God the Father is lover, God the Son is the Beloved, we heard that in our gospel passage. You know, God's, the Father said, said that when Jesus was baptized and also at the transfiguration. This is my beloved Son. So lover, beloved, and, and the Holy Spirit is the love shared um, between Father and Son in this, this community of love. So um, the God of love loved us into existence he created us in his image and likeness. I mean, how cool is that? We're created somehow in God's image and likeness, you know, and, and he, after he finished creation, he, he, you know, he looked back, stood, stood back on the seventh day and took a look at it and was like, well, not bad, really, you know. No, he didn't do that. He's, you know, it wasn't too bad, but no, he said, this is good, you know, and with human beings, this is very good. Um, so we're children of God. His adopted sons and daughters. That spe what a special relationship. So God of love, God, the God of love loved us into existence. There's this whole creation thing. But then um, we mess up, 
and we sin, and God sends us his son Jesus, and Jesus um, loved us into rebirth, into redemption through his mercy, his passion, um, death, and resurrection. Of course, we're focusing on that right now, getting ready for that, the, the commemoration, celebration of the Paschal mystery, the dying and rising of Christ during the, during the Lenten season. So here's this God of love. Um, you know, God loves us unconditionally and sacrificially. How do we respond to that? What does God want from us? Well, obviously, he just wants us to love him in return. Um, I mean, there's a story I like to tell sometimes about this, this guy. He was a, a blue-collar worker, and he, he, on the way home from work, he'd stop by this church um, every, every day, every um, afternoon, late afternoon, and he'd, and he'd, and he'd um, spend an hour in prayer. And so this happened week after week, month after month, year after year. And finally, the pastor of the parish kind of wanted, wondered, wonder what, what's that like? You know, what does he do in there? So he's kind of waiting outside one time, and so he could catch the guy. And, and, he, and, and he asked him, you know, I'm, I'm, I know I'm prying a little bit, but, you know, what does, um, what, what, how do you pray? What, what does that look like for you? And he says, the guy kind of smiled, and he said, um, I go in there, and um, I, I kneel and, or sit or whatever, and I, I, look, I look at God, and God looks at, I look at Jesus, Jesus looks at me, and we love each other. That's what we do here. So, um, in John's gospel, Jesus says to the disciples, whoever loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. That's what kind of relationship God wants to have with us. So there's this twofold love commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and everything. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we're to love God. He wants us to love him. But he also wants us to, to love our neighbor. And so, in fact, I mean, how do we demonstrate our love for God? Well, one way, maybe a significant way, is by loving his children. You know, loving our um, our neighbor, um, our brothers and sisters, and even to love our enemies. I mean, Jesus pushes it that far. Like, really? Okay, you know, I'll try. And of course, you know, in the early church, most of you probably know this, um, the, the Romans, this is what the Romans said about the Christians. See how they love one another. See how they love one another. What a great witness we can give to others to attract them to, you know, to, 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 to come to know Jesus as we know him and to um, become part of the body of Christ, um, his church. So, um, so what does this look like in practice? Okay, there's this kind of abstract sort of theoretical kind of nice words. I think it, it, it looks like what Pope Francis wants to happen in the Synod. Um, the synod is an opportunity for an expression of love for one another if we embrace it, if we enter into this process. What are the elements of such love? What do people who love each other do? Well, first off, they spend time together. Um, you know, if you were in love somebody, you're, you're going to kind of want to be with them. And the first pillar of the synodal process is, is communion. Union, you know, being together. People in love encounter one another, and they they gather together. So that's what we've been doing in in, um, in the synodal process. People coming together and listening to each other. Catholic Christians express communion most profoundly and sacredly in our celebration of the Eucharist, the source and summit of of our Christian lives. So now, again, I'll be getting digging into that in a minute. Um, you know, we're spread in our, uh, uh, the Catholics of this archdiocese, this local church, we're spread throughout the, the, the northeast quadrant of, of, of um, Iowa, but God unites us, uh, he, he unites our local and diocesan church as one. We're, we're one. I mean, we're the body of Christ, all of us universally as a church, but in our in our archdiocese, we're, we're united in, you know, at the local level as well. Paul tells the Philippians and, and us as well to be 
of the same mind, with the same love, united in heart, thinking one thing. That's what you know, Jesus wants us to try, strive for, to come together in that way. Um, you know, um, it's, it's, there's, it's, you might have noticed this, and maybe you haven't noticed this, but it, it, we're polarized right now in our culture. There's divisions. Um, it's one thing to have different opinions, but we're not respectful in how we differ with each other. Um, it's a mess, right? But... Um, and, and, you know, the evil one is, that's how he, that's how he, um, you know, he, he, he's, he's, he's set on dividing us. That's, 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 that's his goal. And we just kind of go along with it. The communion that God builds in our midst, however, is, should be, stronger than any divisions. So in, amidst all, you know, our many differences, we are united in a common baptism as members of the body of Christ. We, we always need to remember that. Um, so people in love, they, they hang, out, hang out together. They also, secondly, <clears throat> talk to each other. They don't just sit there and, okay, we're together, you know. I mean, okay, well, this is good. Um, but they actually, they, they talk to each other. And most especially, we don't just talk at others. We also, obviously, you know, we need to listen carefully and love and lovingly to each other. I mean, true encounter arises only from listening and dialogue. And that's the second pillar of the synodal process is, is participation. So like, you know, participating in the life of whatever a family or marriage or parish or whatever community that, that we participate. And thirdly and finally, people in love then accompany one another. So they're together, you know, and, and enjoying each other's company, being with each other in communion. Um, they, they participate in, in this, um, this group or process, whatever it is, but they also um, journey together, like we're going somewhere, uh, you know, um, and, so, and they walk together. The synod, the word synod means journeying together, journeying together. And the third pillar of the synodal process is mission. So we come together, you know, um, as Catholics and to worship God and everything, but and we don't just turn inward and that's the end of it. We need to go out, too. And Pope Francis talks about that all the time, you know, to go to the peripheries and, and that sort of thing. So there's, uh, um, you know, the, th the third pillar is, is mission. The synod is a process of s spiritual discernment. So like, listen, we're listening to, other, to each other, and then there's this communal discernment of what the Holy Spirit is saying to us in this time and place. So it's just not... It's, we, we listen to the Spirit, too, not just to each other. And then, you know, and then we need to you know, discern the direction in which the Holy Spirit wants to lead us. And then go, you know, act. Like there's this see, judge, and act, this Catholic thing um, that we do. So I'll just conclude this little prelude thing with a quote from Pope Francis, Francis's homily in Rome when he opened the Synod. He said, Dear brothers and sisters, let us have a good journey together. May we, may we be pilgrims in love, in love with the gospel, and open to the surprises of the Holy Spirit. Let us not miss out on the grace-filled opportunities born of encounter, listening, and discernment. In the joyful conviction that even as we seek the Lord, he always comes with his love to meet us first. So now, um, to the kind of heart of my um, remarks, reflections, I'm, I'm going to just kind of play around with, break open um, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth's Apostolic Exhortation, Sacramentum Caritatis, which again is sacrament of charity, sacrament of love. And I was kind of suggesting that the, you know, at the beginning, the Eucharist is centered on love. Jesus' sacrificial and unconditional love for us and our love for him in return. So here's what I'm going to focus um, my time on. Pope Benedict says the Eucharist is a mystery to be believed, a mystery to be celebrated, and a mystery to be lived. So I'm going to kind of unpack and say a word about each aspect of this mystery 
mystery to be believed, a mystery to be celebrated, and a mystery to be lived. And these three aspects of the mystery of the Eucharist kind of encapsulate communion, participation, and mission. And I'll mention that al along the way, you know, the synodal con concept. So first, the Eucharist is a mystery to be believed. Okay, Jesus is present to us in, in many ways. Um, I kind of was playing around with that a little bit with my homily uh, tonight. But he's present to us in many ways, in a special way, in, in his word, in the poor, you know, in Matthew 25, and you see somebody's hungry, whatever, thirsty and um, um, naked, you know, that's Jesus, right? We need to respond to them as we respond to Jesus, to see Jesus in them. So Jesus is present in, in, in his word, in the poor, we're told when two or three are gathered together in prayer and in the sacraments. But in the Eucharist, Jesus is um, uniquely present. Body, blood, soul, and divinity, as it is said. And th this is what, it mean, what we mean when, by the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist, that he's present there fully, you know, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Luke is my favorite gospel, so I was pleased that um, the nuncio and you know, whoever decided that my installation as Archbishop of Dubuque um, would be on the Feast of St. Luke. Um, and in Luke's gospel, um, the meal is a major, major theme. There are ten meals in Luke's gospel, seven before the Last Supper, and and then, you know, and then the Last Supper, and then two after the, the resurrection. In Luke's Gospel, um, this one guy, I think, um, Eugene Leverdier, I think, a, a scripture scholar, says that Jesus basically eats and drinks his way through the Holy Land on his journey to Jerusalem, right? So why, why was the meal such a, an important part of Jesus' ministry? Just think about it, like, you know, the feel of a meal. Sharing a meal with, um, together, is, it's more than simply eating together. I mean, you know, when we're, when we're sitting down and actually, um, not just eating over the sink or something, but actually sharing a meal together, we're, we're, we, in, we invite others into our home um, for, for a meal, you know, and, and in doing so, we're sharing our life with them. We're sharing our very selves with them. They're in our home. There's a special sanctuary. Um, a meal, really, is a sacred time. I mean, probably people that are, aren't even believers, they might not use that language, but they have a sense of that there's something really good about this thing, uh, do, sharing a meal with someone. Meals create and strengthen relationships and they often, they can be a time of reconciliation if we're, if we're open to that and, lo and looking for that. They're a time to give thanks. They are a time of communion, right? So that, that one of those pillars for the synod, communion. And as I said earlier, that Eucharist is a meal par excellence. Par excellence. It is communion with a big capital C the source and summit of our Christian lives. And there's power in the Eucharist, amazing power. Um, we don't even realize how powerful it is and can be in our lives. Or it can be just another meal. Huh? It depends on how we approach it. And that leads us to the next mystery, which is um, celebration. The Eucharist is a mystery to be celebrated. I'm going to talk a little bit, maybe a little bit longer on this, because we could do better, you know, and it would make all the difference. Honestly, um, if we celebrated the Eucharist like to the best of our ability, and we gave it our all, um, full active conscious participation, as the Second Vatican Council calls for, if we did that, that cathedral, all of our churches would be full, packed. Somebody might wander in and see what's going on. They'll come back, and they'll bring others back. It's that simple, really, if, if we do that. But we couldn't, you know, if I say, okay, let's go do that next Sunday. Well, it won't happen because 
In order for that to happen, we need to have a personal relationship with Christ. We need to, you know, um, long, des- you know, desire to be, you know, united with him in the Eucharist and, and with, you know, with one another, united to one another. And we need to kind of know, we need to kind of be formed well enough that we know what's going on there. So it's, there's a lot, it would take a lot to get to that point. But if we did that, and we do the best we can with music, we do the best we can with, with preaching and really hit, have to do that, you know, hard, that would take care of things for us, you know, in terms of um, drawing, bringing people back to the church. So, um, just to look at different ways that we, different meals that that we have. So, might you know, there's one is one way of celebrating a meal, celebrating whatever, is to have a formal banquet. You know, um, so you know when when we, there's, a, there's a formal banquet. We look forward to that, like, wow, this is going to be a really wonderful thing, and, and you know, we're going to share fine food and drink, so we dress up, and um, so that's all, that's, you know, really good in many respects that we, we don't do that so much now. We don't, you know, know many people just, I can't wait to get, go to Mass and to receive the Eucharist and celebrate um, our faith um, with one another, you know, um, and people don't dress up so much, you know, anymore. So that's all fine, but sometimes, so that's a fine analogy, but sometimes, you know, mask, I think, can be too stiff and not relaxed enough. You know, like, um, for example, parents sitting in the back because they're worried about their kids acting up and, and, and them get, getting, getting the evil eye, right? And so it just makes things worse because the kids can't see back there. They can't participate. So, like, Presiding at Mass, and there's only a few priests there, so the rest of you guys probably don't care that much about this, but presiding at Mass is an art. Um, there's got to, you know, there's got to be a horizontal kind of part of it and a vertical thing. Sometimes people focus on the vertical, like the transcendence and um, divinity, and that's, that's fine. We need to do that better, you know, but then it be, can become wooden if it's just, you know, um, if we just kind of, you know, we're not if we don't humanize it. So there needs to be the horizontal, too. Jesus was divine and human. There needs to be, we need to put our personalities into it as well, too, presiders, but not so much where it becomes folksy and guys kind of doing whatever language, whatever word, using whatever the words they want. Um, so we need to humanize it, but it needs to be about Christ, not about me, you know, telling jokes all the time and doing, you know, that's, there's a place for some of that, but so to, to, for it to be divine, transcendent, vertical, we need to do that, but then also balance it with, um, you know, the, um, the horizontal, a human, a human thing. So it's an art to do that. I don't, always, I don't always do it the best myself, you know, so. But anyway, another way of celebrating a meal is to go to a restaurant. And when we do, um, the host of that, you know, whoever's there serving us, the host is the pr- provider, server, and cleanup crew. The guests, of course, are the customers, and they're the consumers. How many of us approach the mass as consumers? Like, I'm going there to get something. They're doing all the work and everything. Um, do I participate, right? So again, the sense in older language, do I participate actively, listen, again, synodal language, attentively, respond enthusiastically, sing joyfully? I look out sometimes and, gosh, you know, every parish has its own personality and you see all different kinds of things, but sometimes you look out like, hardly anybody's singing? It just breaks my heart. And a lot of, to- a lot of times, it's like none, hardly any guys are singing. Why is that? Why don't we sing? You know, like, it's wonderful to have a, a group of priests together, deacons, you know, and we're just cross-section of society. We're not necessarily be called to be priests or deacons because we can sing great. Some of us are, are better singers than others, but we all sing, and it's such a wonderful song, not to be sexist or anything at all, but you just you never hear that very well, much out there. Why don't we do that? So I think part of the problem is, you know, um, 
nobody's singing, and if, you, if you, somebody takes a risk and sings, that they can hear themselves, because nobody else is singing. So it's like it's, it's all or nothing. Let's just all do it. And then we won't, none of us will hear ourselves. Let's just all do it. It would make a huge difference. I tell you what, it would make a huge difference. How can we get people to participate? You know, singing is one thing, but you know, participate in other ways as well. Uh, so yeah, so um, am I simply a passive observer at Mass? Or um, do I just come to get something provided by others? Is that what it looks like for me, for some of our, a lot of our folks? So another way to celebrate, to share a meal, is to have a potluck supper. You know, that's kind of a nice image of the Eucharist. It's perhaps a bit too ordinary, but at least its participants are more involved in the meal, you know, than going to a restaurant. They would feel selfish and ungrateful if they didn't prepare and bring a dish. Huh? So that pulls you into this thing. So, an analogy to the Mass, do I prepare myself for Mass? Do I read the sacred um, scripture readings ahead of time? Um, I mean, I have so a couple sisters that we have this ongoing argument. It hasn't happened for a few years now, but, but they think that you have to have the readings. They really want to have the readings in front of them. Um, it, it bothers them when they can't read along. I'm like, no, that's not what's going on Mass. If you want to do Bible study, go to Bible study. Or if you want to, and you can you know, read it ahead of time, but at Mass, that's not what's going on there. We're listening. And maybe we just, there's one sentence or one idea or one word that really jumps out at us. It's, it's worship. It, uh, it's not just you know, everybody's reading along and then the lector kind of reads out loud, like that's their job. That's, and sometimes lectors, that's kind of, how they read. No, they're interpreting the word. They're translating into language you can understand just by how they, they know it so well, just by how they, um, they, they, they proclaim the passage. Um, it helps us to understand it better. You know, it's an art that is too, just like presiding. So anyway, um, do I read the scripture? Ideally, we'd all do that and reflect on it, and then we, we're going to hear it way better, differently, if we do that. Do I bring my best self to the Mass? Do I arrive early to pray? I'm going to say something that probably will get, get me in trouble, but, but, um, but, you know, like I try to get, I like to get, early, get to uh, Mass early um, in, so I can pray for whenever, sometimes I, often I can't, but I try, that's my goal before Mass, but gosh, it's never quiet in there. It's like the musicians are practicing, people praying the rosary, wonderful things, you know, rosary. But, you know, it's just never quiet. I, I wonder, is there a way that we can just have some quiet, you know, prepare ourselves for Mass? Um, do I bring a sense of joyful anticipation? You know, like, I'm really looking for something here. Or just kind of going through the motions. Another way to share a meal is to eat fast food. Um, that's kind of common these days. So is mass for me like a trip to McDonald's? Do I want to get in, eat fast, and get out quickly? Um, no music, no baptisms, no frills, no coffee and donuts. You know, I leave before the final song. It's like a prison sentence. I'm doing, I have to do time, you know. It's all about obligation. Do I have... You know, only a minimal engagement with fellow parishioners. I know that's not you guys. You wouldn't be here otherwise um, listening to me. So finally, I think, yeah, so now the last analogy, and all these are, you know, interesting kind of things to reflect on, but the last one's a family reunion. I think that's it's kind of a, a good image for the Eucharist, a time, you know, we get together with people that we know and love, maybe haven't seen for a while. It's time to rest, pray, listen, talk, remember and eat favorite foods, you know, with um, old friends, while at the same time welcoming new members to the family. <clears throat> you know, family reunions, reunions provide, or they can, provide opportun opportunities for healing if family members are willing to set aside differences. And that happens in our celebration of the Eucharist as well. There should be healing that takes place there, forgiveness and uh, mercy. 
So the Lord wants us to bring our best selves to this feast and to enter into the Mass as fully as possible. I mean, we should be tired. Presiders, talk to any presider, you know, you, obviously we're giving, we should be giving a lot to it. It's, it's just an hour maybe, but I, I'm, I, I, you're tired after celebrating Mass. If you do it really well, you put your um, full um, self into it. So, but the assembly should do the same thing. And when we do that, there's tremendous power in the Eucharist. It can bring about miracles, as we see in the gospel story, the multiplication of the loaves and fish, which is, you know, the foretaste of the Last Supper. So finally, the Eucharist is not only a mystery to be believed. It is that, and that's really important. It's not only a mystery to be celebrated, again, very important, but also a mystery to be lived. As I was saying, you know, it's just we don't do this thing here. Okay, we're done. We go live our lives in the secular world. This is where we do our religious stuff. Then we go out and, you know, and do our secular stuff. No, we become what we believe, receive, and celebrate. We become that. Jesus, right? Um, when we eat regular food, it becomes us. When we eat the Eucharist, we become it. We become Christ. Think about that. Just pray about that sometime. You know, wow. We become Christ. We're made in the image and likeness of God. We become Christ in the Eucharist. So when, when we're dismissed, we're to take Jesus out into the world, into our daily lives. It's like, okay, we've had a nice time here celebrating the Eucharist. Now get out of here and take the Eucharist with you. We're to be Christ for others, to see Christ in them to share Christ with them, help them to see Christ in themselves and to bring it, him out of them. So that's mission, right? You know, that synodal language, that's mission. That's our baptismal mission. When we receive um, the gift of the, Eucharist, of the Eucharistic Christ into our own bodies, um, we say yes to our commitment to carrying out Jesus' mission on earth by feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, welcoming the stranger, comforting the sick, and befri bef befriending the lonely. I think that's from the Eucharist, that's Eucharistic revival language. So, we, you know, we are to take the good news of Jesus Christ out into the world and share it with others. We're to help those who are on the peripheries and, and reach out to them, whether they're, whether they're um, physical, um, mental peripheries, or existential peripheries. At a Sunday at Angelus, Pope Francis once said, once said, we can evaluate our Eucharistic adoration according to how we take care of our neighbor like Jesus does. People hunger for food, but also for companionship, consolation, Friendship, good humor, attention. The Eucharist is um, spiritual and sacramental food for us and those with whom we share it on our journey through this life and on our journey from this life to the next through that thin veil that um, when, when, we, when we get close to the, to the end of our lives. Baptism calls us, we're going to renew our baptismal promises at, at Easter. It was really important to reflect on what we believe, um, you know, uh, what we say we believe in, in, in our, um, in ba at baptism. Um, baptism calls us to publicly witness to what we believe, celebrate, and live, which is the real presence of God in the Eucharist, the good news of Jesus Christ, the joy of the gospel. So publicly witness that to every person, and particularly those who are living life on the periphery, as I said, those who are hurting and suffering the most. That is our mission as baptized believers and um, disciples of Christ. So to conclude, when people encounter us individually, do they see and experience true, authentic, genuine, sacrificial, 
unconditional love. To pull love back into this at the end here. And when they encounter us collectively, do they think to themselves and say to one another, see how they love one another. So thank you very much.